So I wanted, first of all, to welcome our speakers. Um, we, I'm going to do short introductions because it's a short session. Um, so we have uh, Alex, who's a principal researcher at Nestor's Center for Collective Intelligence Design, Michal, who's the founder and CEO of Climate Policy Radar, and Maddy, who is the director of the UK program at the European Climate Foundation. Um, the, the first question I'm going to put to our panelists is, um, is about the, the implied relationship in, in so much civic tech between providing information, and we had some examples just now as well, um, and that information could be in different forms, databases, uh, analytics, research, um, and then the relationship to action. So I wanted to ask panelists, to what extent do you think that there is a principle about access to information in itself, or which is important regardless of its direct effectiveness, or do you think it's a necessary foundation uh, with direct applied consequences for action and activism and change? Um, so I'll start with Miha. Um, you built a database, <laughs> so you can tell us a bit more about uh, how you think that that can influence climate action. Thank you. Hi, everyone, uh, here and online. Um, it's great that this conference is online. It means uh, greater access, right? Even if you don't get a visa or can't afford a plane fare and all of those things. And um, I don't imagine that there's simultaneous translation into languages that some of us don't speak, but that's another element of access. And all of those things start to underpin the question of how do we take the information that we are sharing here and the information that uh, we need in order to make any change necessary and put it to actual action. So Climate Policy Radar has been building the database, I really hate this word, the database on climate laws and policies and soon litigation cases globally. So all of the uh, great things that Nick has just said about needing to understand who's doing what so we can understand what works so we can do it better actually are translated into the detail, the fine details. Knowing we need climate action is not going to be enough. Um, we need to make better laws. We need to make better policies. We need to make better commitments and have implementation models for those. Um, we need to see that those commitments are carried forward in budgets. We need to see that um, they are taken to the courts and, um, uh, and acted upon. And we need to see that they influence moving money around um, in terms of investment and lending and insurance um, applications of those. So what does that look like? Um, we're all asking big questions on how do we make a city more resilient? How do we decarbonize a building? How do we decarbonize a transport system? How do we decarbonize food? How do we increase resilience? The details of that lie in paragraphs of um, very long documents in multiple languages that you need to find on uh, government websites if you're lucky, if they're there, if the government hasn't blocked them and you need to pay for access if you're lucky. Um, and being able to make those transparent and accessible is, is our mission. So what does that mean? It means that we um, uh, create a one-stop shop of everything and um, have people ask questions to it. So Nick was talking about independent oversight as one of the six principles. So if you search for who's doing or who's talking about independent oversight for uh, committees or processes, you can actually find the, the actual passage and the actual text and say, ah, oh, these in this law, in this paragraph, they committed to that. You can probably follow up on that. The processes in, this, in, in which this feeds into are three key processes. One is the lawmaking or the policy making. Um, and that obviously doesn't include only the policy makers, but also all the pyramid that sits underneath the policy making. So the think tanks, the consultants, the academics, um, and everyone who feeds into how do we do policy better. The counterpart of that, which is policy accountability, which is a lot of, uh, a lot of the weight of that is being uh, held by civil society, who is asking, are they doing it okay, and how can we get them to do it better? And by the legal community, um, who um, takes corporates, governments, individuals to court um, over not fulfilling those, uh, those commitments. And the other, um, uh, the other part, which is the, um, uh, let's call it the moving money around part, um, which is how do we look at policy as a metric of risk? Um, we know that the hurricane is coming, but do we, ha do we have an early warning system? We know that the uh, sea level is ri rising, but how are we doing on building seawalls? Or how are we doing on insurance schemes 
to do um, to do better on that? How can we learn from successes? How can we avoid mistakes? So these are the two um, um, kind of uh, core elements of uh, of that. Um, we are seeing a hundred countries using uh, people from a hundred countries so far using um, our resources, which is a start. That's about half of the countries in the world. It's a start. Um, between um, policy, government, academia, journalists, citizens, um, mainly the people who we call knowledge workers, the people whose job it is to go and digest and synthesize a lot of this information and make it into actionable parts. Long answer to a short question. No, great answer, thank you. Um, Alex, so you, you, your work mediates knowledge. You work more directly with people. You think about participation. Um, so how do you understand that relationship between information and action? Yeah, I think it's really important to think about who is taking action. So I think one of the remarkable things about the methods that my team works with, for example, crowdsourcing, citizen science, crowd mapping, is that they involve communities and the public in gathering data and generating new insights about the issues that really matter to them, often really locally specific issues when it comes to the environment. So you're measuring water pollution or air pollution that affects you on a day-to-day -day level, and that becomes a tool for people to take action themselves. I think that's really powerful. Um, what we see uh, I think more rarely <laughs> is that officials are taking this kind of data seriously and I think that often there's a kind of criticism uh, towards citizen generated data around data quality which honestly is a bit of a cop out all data sets have limitations and it's understanding what is good enough data what is it showing you in complement to other um, sources of information that you're using um, but through our work, we've also seen really amazing examples where you, these participatory methods are then being used uh, to take action, not only by the people taking part, but also by officials. So, for example, in Ghana, there is a citizen science initiative around uh, um, collecting data on marine litter. And I think one of the reasons that this has been really successful um, and has managed to build like an input into action by the government as well is because there wasn't an existing data infrastructure around it. So there was no challenge to a kind of traditional way of measuring the problem. And so it was illuminating a kind of invisible, invisible issue. And the way that they set it up is working with local youth groups, local NGOs to collect data about plastic pollution on the beaches. They also involved the national statistics officers of Ghana, and now it's being used as part of the official SDG reporting by the government. Another example, which is one of my favorites, um, is uh, called Peta Benchana. It's an initiative that was started in Indonesia, in Jakarta where uh, local citizen reports um, are aggregated um, when floods are happening to understand in real time what uh, parts of the city are being affected. And these citizen reports are used to generate a real-time map that is made public. So it's not only used by officials to make decisions about emergency response, but it's also used by members of the public who can make decisions about how to move around the city or check whether the parts of the city where their friends and family live are badly affected. So I think there's a real power to the types of methods that we work with to make a better connection to action on the ground as well as then um, also having an impact in these kind of uh, rooms where decisions are made. Thank you. Um, Maddie. so from your perspective, your funding action, um, so where do you think there's a, the intersection of understanding and evidence and, and then doing comes in? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, European Climate Foundation, where I work, has been on quite a journey over the last kind of 10 years alongside the rest of the climate movement and moving from the technical to the political. Um, and I think that came through quite a lot in what Nick was talking about, you know, with climate, you've got a physical problem, you need to solve it with physical things. And for a long time, it was pointy head policy people in a room coming up with some amazing solution, writing a report, you get it on the desk of a policymaker, job done, they'll be convinced. And 
you know, we all know that's not how change happens. Um, change is messy, politics is messy, and people are messy. So I'm not saying that provision of information is not important or that the quality of the information environment out there isn't important, but you can't turn up to a knife fight with an Excel spreadsheet. It just, you know, you're not going to get what you need. So I think what we need is stuff based, as you say, stuff that enables action. Um, again, Nick said, in the climate space, you often get asked, are you pessimistic or are you optimistic? And I think, like... My answer is always I'm neither, I'm an activist, and that means I need action. So I guess where what we would look for from civic tech solutions is stuff that helps us with that challenge of building a public and political mandate. So again, as Nick said, you know, we're moving to a stage of the transition now that touches on everybody's lives and on very kind of personal decisions. And we're gonna have to make big changes. And policymakers can't do that without a public mandate and without a political mandate. And that is often based on two aspects of fairness. So it's distributional fairness of who pays and who benefits, but also procedural fairness of who was involved in the decision making and who finally decided. And it feels like that is just the sweet spot. Super interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, all three of you. Um, do you think there are gaps specifically for civic tech that you, you've identified through your own work that kind of speak to that need to move from just bringing the information together to that action and to the politics, which is emotional? This is, this is about getting together. Nick was talking about the, that sense that citizens agree, broadly, mm -hmm. setting aside the US, um, that, that climate action is necessary, but they feel dispersed, alone, and not able to work in concert. So what's, do you think there's a sweet spot mm -hmm. when when you see this? Um, yeah, I'll jump in and then I'll pass along. I think that the, the, that phenomenon Nick talked about, we we call the perception gap. So the gap between what people think, what people think the public thinks, and then also crucially what MPs think the public thinks. Um, we've been supporting a new initiative called Climate Barometer, which is doing kind of biannual, I think, trackers of MP opinion and public opinion to show that perception gap. And it's particularly intense with when it comes to renewables. So 80% of the public support solar farms, solar arrays, even where they live. But MPs only think 25% of the public do because that idea of nimbyism is so baked in. And that gives us that political impasse where if that's the mindset that our political decision makers are operating in that is never actually reflecting democratically what the, the public want. Um, so we've done some research recently which has looked at the specifically participatory methods, how they're being used for climate adaptation and climate mitigation specifically in the global south. Um, and as part of that we kind of also thought about the gaps that these types of collective intelligence methods are filling. We saw a lot of action when it comes to data gaps and uh, actually diversity gaps, so involving different types of people in generating that data. Um, but this point about uh, decision making and bringing people together specifically around uh, issues that are very divisive and where costs, benefits, trade-offs really need to be considered is still you know, very underserved by civic technology, by collecting intelligence methods, even though there's a lot of potential there. I feel like we are at the stage now where climate assemblies are widely accepted. Everyone is kind of on board with them. They're almost part of, I, I don't know, I think they're, they're, they're widely known. Um, and then we have at the other side quite a lot of public polling and there's, or focus groups, and there's very little in between. And I think civic technology has a lot of potential to be much more imaginative about the ways that we're bringing people together to discuss issues. Um, and also having an aspect of kind of storytelling to it. Because at the moment, I think this kind of distance gap between official knowledge, scientific knowledge, and public understanding is like, is a major issue. So how we communicate that information is really important. Um, we, in my team, are trying to develop new technologies that kind of sit in the middle there that 
have the benefits of actually bringing small groups of people together to discuss, use digital storytelling, but also have that kind of gathering of data about what they think and how that changes as the discussion develops. And we ran a pilot last year with 12 local authorities in the UK to uh, help them engage their local residents in discussions about possible net zero policies that would work in their local areas using this approach of combining you know, the creative storytelling, the digital platform, the small group discussions. And it, it seems to work. People really enjoy it and they say that <laughs> they've come away having learned a lot, um, but also appreciated the fact that they managed to come together with others like them and hear different views, as well as realizing, oh, people, there are more people who share the views that I have. So. Thank you. I have a lot of problems, a lot of gaps, so I'm gonna uh, touch upon them briefly. Um, and I'm gonna start with the, um, the paralysis that comes with not having enough information or information that you don't trust. Um, and that paralysis leaves us in a status quo. And that's exactly where we don't want to stay because the status quo isn't cutting it for us, right? Um, so I think there's, a, there's um, we've all talked about different data sets. I talked about policy and you talked about citizen science and there's um, earth observation data. And they're all in different places. And the fact that they're not connected, A, is a technological problem and a governance issue of the data. Um, but that is part of the story that leaves us um, unable to make decisions because we can say these are the policies, but we don't know if they work. Because until we say these are deforestation policies and this is deforestation is measured from, uh, I don't know, uh, from space by satellites or by um, uh, IoT uh, devices on trees measuring their health, then we have no idea if this works. Um, and then we have very little uh, uh, capability of actually making decisions that are um, at the scale that we need to be making them. Um, and then we rely, we rely on anecdotes, and then we rely on biased data, and rely on partial data, or we don't do anything at all, and we're, we're stuck where we are. So that is one thing, which is the connectivity and the scope, and, and there's, a, there's a risk of too much information paralysis, and there's a risk of too little information paralysis. I don't have enough, or I have too much, and I don't know what to do with that. And um, using technology in order to bridge that, to make giant um, um, amounts of information digestible and understandable and actionable is one thing that tech can do. And bringing more information and more data um, where, where little is uh, accessible or available is the second part. So we need to find ourselves somewhere between those two paralyses. Um, the second part that I want to talk about is trust. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about AI. but. Data is worth nothing if you don't trust it, if you don't trust its source, if you don't trust its credibility, if you don't so, uh, trust its, uh, I saw this great jumper on someone on the back um, about open data, um, there you go. Um, if the data is closed, if the model is closed, if you don't know where it came from, um, then, well, you're either um, at risk of using very biased data or you don't use it at all. Um, so the trust issue is, is critical and um, we're at, the, at a dangerous place in hype cycle with uh, generative AI, for example, where we're just all afraid of hallucination, therefore um, um, uh, not going to use it for the critical uses that we're, going, that we're going to need it. And there's a big step that technology needs to make and the people using technology need to make in making those uh, things more transparent and more um, uh, trustworthy. Or, or trust building uh, in order for that to, um, to happen. The, I'm mainly presenting uh, problems rather than solutions, right? For because we're talking about the gaps. And the third one, which is I think is critical, um, we're talking about narratives and how do we get people to make decisions. And obviously very different um, um, narratives are, uh, are needed and very different formats of presentation are needed for different types of decision making. Um, the, um, the MP who doesn't know much about a topic but needs to vote on a bill today um, needs very different information from an insurance company who wants to tick certain boxes in order to determine whether a deal is a go or no go, or what will you know will they insure or not insure this asset, or will they or uh, a lender that wants to set an interest rate on a project. Very very different framing. In both of those, there is a difference between the data that is needed, and I'm going to call it the norms or the ethical framework that is used in order to govern what is it that we're trying to optimize for. 
Uh, think Google Maps. Do you want to get there in the shortest way, or in the prettiest way, or in the l least carbon way? All the answers will be right, depending on what you're optimizing for. And often, when we uh, talk about data and narratives, we're conflating the two, and therefore optimizing sometimes for things that we didn't intend to optimize for. Um, so distinguishing between those two and making it really clear what is the data and what is the story is also another critical thing that we need to think about and also goes a long way towards trust building and avoiding misinformation, disinformation, and on many other uh, dangers that we have. Um, just to make sure we've got a couple of minutes for, for the questions as well. I, I think one of the really interesting things across all of those and, and reflecting as well on yesterday a little bit too, is that there's the question of the content. So there's the, the information, whatever it happens to be. And then there's the form that that information takes. So a lot of the things that you're talking about are the form. So it's how do you then make that information available, in what ways, to which people, thinking about the audience, thinking about the intention of, of uh, sharing that information, how you tell the story, where it hits, in what ways. And I think that's an interesting part of the discussion on, on civic tech that maybe maybe has had less attention or, or could be surfaced and made, and made more significant as part of, of the conversations we have about civic tech. It's a, re a f reflection for me as someone who's a little bit outside of it, but, but listening in. And I wondered if you had a last thought about that. Do you mind if I jump in for yeah, a second? Definitely. So uh, uh, policy is an actually a good example because uh, we w um, all of the uh, use cases that I mentioned earlier, from the policymakers to the civil society to the private sector, um, are all asking questions that are made out of the same, I'm gonna call them Lego blocks. Um, uh, what technology can we use in order to decarbonize um, our transportation system? What governance uh, arrangements do we need in order to ensure the least damage when an extreme weather event like a flood or a hurricane happens? So if you think about, you, you break down this question, my question into the Lego blocks, you're gonna say, I want to find uh, where there are floods or hurricanes. I want to find technologies. I'm interested in this sector. I'm interested in these policy instruments. So the base layer of that is actually shared amongst multiple questions. So whether you want to fund a project or you want to ask, um, what will my business be? Uh, will my business be viable in five years' time um, based on the regulation that's here or coming in? Or whether you want to ask, is this government doing enough on X? Or how can I write a bill that improves this? The building blocks of the question are identical or almost identical, but they're shared amongst many, many use cases. And a lot of the um, uh, action in this space is focused on building the verticals that sit on top of that, but fairly little on the horizontal shared data system that underpins all of that. Once we have that, and once we say, okay, now I can find stuff about transport, because it's not a control find truck, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, how can we now take that and then build something? You will want a one pager in font 15 because you don't have a lot of time. You will want an API that goes directly into your modeling system. You will want a question answering, uh, um, a little bot that you can converse with the text and say, I'm writing a policy. How can I uh, think about this better? But um, all of that relies on fairly shared infrastructure. And I think that that will be true for many, many of the data sets and how they are utilized is mainly a matter of form. And um, thinking about those as um, distinct but very complementary issues will perhaps help us not think about those as completely uh, disparate and help us connect and, and, and see synergies between the data sets. I actually have a very similar answer. We talk about that as being the fundamental digital public infrastructure that needs to be built. Unfortunately, there are very few people who want to fund that because it's not as sexy as the individual use cases. Um, but it's not just about developing that shared public infrastructure around data sets. I think there's also something about um, shared uh, or open models, um, also improving documentation. But then I think despite the importance of having those shared kind of infrastructures and ecosystems, we can't take away from the need for localization in order for these types of technologies to actually succeed. Um, and uh, where we see that working best again, so going back to the example that I mentioned earlier, Peta Benchana, it's powered by a platform called Cognicity, which is open source and 
I mean, there are so many places around the world being affected by flooding and other hazards at the moment. Um, the initial project started in Jakarta. It's now being used across Indonesia. It's also being trialed in the Philippines, in Panama. And I think in each case, the thing that makes it uh, a success is that it's built with local implementation partners who tailor the tool to the needs that they have. And that's really, really important. Unfortunately, some of the um, kind of ambition that we have for civic tech to work in multiple places around the world will also need to have like enough attention on, for example, if we think about language models, making sure that we're thinking about developing technology for languages that are lower resource and I think that's a really big opportunity for investment for digital public infrastructure as well. Just what they said. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, we're okay. Do we have any slide ideas? Okay. I think it's for you, Maddie. Some of the most effective civic tech runs humbly, quietly in the background. When will funders start supporting these instead of new, shiny, shiny, Maddie? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I think there is a quite a shift again within funders to thinking about funding an ecosystem approach. Um, but I think a lot of... So what when I say an ecosystem approach, I mean not purely on delivering X objective in policy, therefore fund these different functions to do a, operate a theory of change to win that one policy. But it's more about thinking, right, in a, to have a holistic theory of change where we are able to pull every lever, we need a strong political advocacy outfit, we need a strong policy engine, we need a strong public engagement function, and we need to be able to do kind of air war with media and social media. And so thinking about resourcing up organizations to then be agile and more nimble and responsive um, across a whole set of decarbonization challenges. So I guess making the case for civic tech to be one of those foundational pieces of the ecosystem, I think, is the challenge. And I think that's what, Mikhail, you, you, you mentioned earlier about this, it being an infrastructure that's then available to everyone. Like, we build infrastructure that is unbranded, available to everyone to support on comms, on polling and insights, on narrative. But I guess I don't hear people talking about civic tech in those terms, maybe enough. So it's a very good challenge. and. I will carry that back into the funding community and challenge others with it. Thank you. Um, if we do one up here and then one from the room. Is that right? um, how does civic tech engage the disengaged or does it just reach those who are already interested? Alex, do you want to take that one away? I mean, we need to go where people are. This, uh, there, I think everyone knows the answers. I think part of the uh, challenge that's often leveled at the civic tech community is that just making something open doesn't mean that people are going to come to you. And I think that's fair. You need to understand the kind of channels that people are using to exchange information and build the kind of technology that is able to meet them there. Or to understand where they're meeting other like-minded people in their community and go to those groups and uh, actually try and offer your solution in those kinds of contexts and circumstances. When we ran the pilot that I mentioned earlier, the strategy room, we had to work really hard to try and get local residents in the room who aren't the people who are already converted. We worked with local volunteer networks and um, other kind of civil society organizations who already hosted meetings with their members and were interested in offering them a kind of new type of experience. And I think, yeah, just meeting people where they are, it, it's not rocket science. You kind of need to just do it. Uh, this is a yes and uh, to what Alex just said. It, particularly with climate change, which is a everything in, like, everything everywhere all at once kind of story, right? Um, I think there's a question of uh, resource deployment, especially when we are still an under-resourced, uh, let's call it a sector or, or 
um, a, a, a kind of supply. And we have to ask, what are the ways in which we can put our resources to best use, fighting against the clock? What are the ways in where we can make the most impact, given um, the, you know, the time and the, and, and the limited resources? And there, it is really, really tempting to go to concentrations of power, to say, we're going to focus on the five highest emitters, or on the five least developed countries, or on the biggest corporations. And that, it's a real temptation. Um, and I'm um, fighting against it very hard, um, while also succumbing to it sometimes. It is really important that we figure out the Chinas and the Indias and the uh, and the U.S.s first, because if we, f you know, if we sort those out, then we have um, I don't know three quarters of the world's emissions. Um, uh, uh, there are a couple of other countries that make seventy-five percent, but. Um, and if we sort that out, then the very, very long tail is, um, in terms of mitigation, potentially, um, I'm trying to avoid words um, that put me in big trouble, but um, there are places that make more impact than others. Um, and the same is with resilience, except with resilience, the long tail is much more spread. Um, so there's a constant um, dilemma there, and I just want to bring it to light because I don't, I don't know that it has an easy solution, but it's not obvious that, um, that um, only working from a community up level and only targeting individuals is going to cut it. A lot of this, very similar to the whole um, um, uh, personal carbon footprint, which is uh, invented by BP in order to distract us from the fact that we can solve this at the supply level rather than at the demand level. Um, very similar to that, we need to make sure that we um, acknowledge that there are very small uh, places of power that we can target um, very, very quickly. And there, it doesn't matter if they're disengaged, you must engage them regardless of anything. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, <coughs> excellent challenge by Africa. Um, is there anyone in the room? Okay, fine. No? We've, sol we've solved everything, excellent. On, on that note, I think it's about time now, isn't it? Thank you very much to all the panelists.